there are three objects in the three things in the title minimal discrepancy which i don't expect you to know isolated singularity well i'll explain that but you should know that and i hope you know what this is all of you so great so so what's an isolated singularity well what what do i mean by an isolated singularity so i have some I'll just write it down, sorry. I have some affine variety in Cn, so it's cut out by some polynomials. And I'm going to assume A, so it is aff an affine variety. And it's either, uh, so it's either smooth at zero or has an isolated singularity. At zero. So it's either smooth at zero or it has an isolated singularity at zero. So, you know, if you take, you know, the polynomials defining A, and you look at a small neighborhood of zero, and you look at the Jacobian of those polynomials that has constant rank near zero, but the rank could jump um, down if you were hit zero. Okay. Um, so a sort of picture is like this. I mean, A may behave in a funny way here. It might have horrible things here, but I'm only interested in this bit here. And I'm interested in, you know, the, just the germ of A at zero. OK. So from this, we can form its link. So if I take A and I intersect it with a small sphere, so epsilon sphere, this is, um, I'm going to define this as LA, and this is called the link. So this is a manifold, and so it's a, this is a real, real two n dimensional so if dim a, dimension of a is n, complex dimension of a is n, then this is a two n minus one dimensional real <coughs> manifold. So an example, well, a good affine variety is just Cn. And then its link is just the 2n minus 1 sphere. And another example would be the link of z1 squared plus z2 squared plus z3 squared equals 0. And I think that's rp3. rp, yeah, 3. OK? So those are some examples. So notice, so, so we, have a, a def, we have a definition. So, and this is a definition This is inspired by Hagard's thesis. So inspired by Hagard's thesis. So, uh, um, so A is topologically smooth if LA is diffeomorphic to S2n minus 1, which is the link of the smooth singularity. So smooth singularities are topologically smooth. Um, and, but the answer is there are singularities that are topologically smooth, but not, um, can, can you see here? Yeah. The, 
they're, 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 they're topologically smooth, but they're, they're not smooth themselves. So I'll give you an example that I like. I like this example a lot. Z1 squared Z2 equals Z3. Z1 cubed Z4 equals Z3. Uh, Z1, Z2 cubed, Z2 squared equals Z4 cubed. Is that no. I'll give you some other examples which are easier. I, I just like this example. So this is a subset. Is this a subset of C4? Sorry? Um, because um, it will point, you'll, uh, you'll see why in, when I write the next theorem. Okay. Okay, so the link of this is S3, but it's not smooth at zero. Okay. So, so you might think, well, it's kind of hopeless, but there's a theorem by Mumford. So if the dimension of A, complex dimension of A is 2, and A is normal, so I'll explain what that means. and topologically smooth. So that means LA is S3. In fact, you just need LA simply connected I mean, by the Poincaré. I mean, that's all he assumed. But. So um, uh, then A is smooth at 0. Okay. So topologically smooth implies smooth in the case of normal singularities. And so if you took this singularity and you normalized it, you'll get something smooth. So what does normal mean? So normal means, normal means the sort of removable singularity theorem for functions holds. So normal means, means um, every holomorphic function on a minus 0 extends, let's say, actually, let's do it like this. So every function defined on a minus 0, which is holomorphic near 0, Uh, extends to a function, um, say f tilde, which is holomorphic. So define f tilde defined on C n, holomorphic near zero. OK, so Mumford's theorem is false in higher dimensions. So this is, a, this is really a simpler example of a topologically smooth, non-smooth singularity. But I wanted to do this next. So, so Mumford's theorem is false in higher dimensions. So I take the link. I, take, I look at the singularity the link of z1 squared, z2 squared, z3 squared, plus z4, 1, 2, 3, 4, cubed, uh, equals 0. This link is uh, diffeomorphic to S5. And it's also normal. Hypersurface singularities whose singular set is uh, very high co-dimension and normal, like co-dimension higher than one. Okay, so that's by Sayers criterion or something. Okay. Uh, okay. So 
this is the algebraic motivation of my talk. So I'm going to give you a symplectic motivation now. motivation. So let's, so, so on say CN we have the standard symplectic structure. So this is just, you know, the sum dxi wedge dyi, like this. We have a question which is the following question. So um, suppose omega is symplectic on Cn with omega equals omega standard outside a compact set. Um, is Cn with this omega symplectomorphic to Cn with this omega standard? I don't know. I have no idea. I'll tell you a little bit of what I, I I'll just explain. So, um, OK. So I'll tell, you, I'll tell you a story in a minute. And that's the, the deepest thought I've had, which is very deep. So. So yeah, so n equals 1, that's just volume. And then n equals 2, everyone knows it's by Gromov. And then n equals 3, we have absolutely no idea. So I had this uh, uh, dream that I was in this conference. And Mohammed Abuzaid was there. And he claimed he could prove this for n equals 3. And uh, he was about to tell me the equations. <laughs> And then I woke up. <laughs> so, oh well. <laughs> so, okay. So there's a more general question you can ask, which is um, the following. So, so this is this doesn't really. This is like a more open-ended question, really. So what are the strong symplectic fillings of the 2n minus 1 sphere with the standard contact structure. OK? So take the 2n minus 1 sphere with the standard contact structure. So this 2n minus 1 sphere, this is, well, this is the link of Cn. So this is in Cn. And the standard contact structure that's uh, dxj, uh, yj dxj minus xj dyj, like this. And strong symplectic filling is exactly what Yanko was talking about. So it's 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 not exact, not necessarily exact, but it has this nice collar neighborhood on the boundary. That's what strong. That's what I mean by strong. He just called it a filling, but um, okay. So. That's the motivation. So now let's bring this back to singularity theory. So, so recall I have my affine variety in Cn, and then I have this link is the intersection with the sphere. And then there's this result. So then, then we can do the following. So we can take this form here and restrict it to, to So actually, another way of saying that is I can take um, some hyperplane distribution in LA. And this is the, the um, this is LA into, so the tangent bundle of LA 
intersected with i times, well, I don't know how you, j0 times the tangent bundle of a. So j0 is standard complex structure. on Cn. So I take the Ta and I intersect it with um, T j naught times Ta. And then there's a result by Kwachenko in 1970. So he said, so, so, um, so for epsilon small enough, This is a this is a contact structure. And it's an invariant of the germ of the singularity at zero. So it's an invariant of the germ of A at zero. So the analytic germ of A at zero. So we have our link, and we have our contact structure. And, um, but now we, so now we have more structure on our link. So we can ask, what is the relationship between the algebraic properties of A near 0 and the contact properties of this, this, um, this thing? OK. So. Um, Maybe I should say a definition as well. So, um, so, okay, I'll write this definition here. So, definition um, if I have some contact structure like this, so is Milner fillable. by A if C with this contact structure is contactomorphic to LA. OK? So this is like a filling, but with a sort of singularity at the origin. And if you resolve the singularity, then you'll get a strong filling. So this is why I was talking about strong fillings earlier. Okay, so then there's this conjecture. This is what sort of got me thinking about this a little bit in the first place. Also, certain papers by Collar also got me interested in this that he published, he released an archive last year. Um, so there's this conjecture by si Paul Seidel. So, if so he, he just conjectured this in complex dimension three, but I'm going to conjecture this for all. So if um, LA with this contact structure is contactomorphic to, uh, say, the link of the standard singularity, and this is just the same as the 2n minus 1 sphere with the standard complex contact structure, which I wrote over there. Um, then I say and A is normal. So if this and this, then A is smooth at zero. Okay. And this is a generalization of Mumford's theorem, because Mumford, even though he's just dealing with diffeomorphisms of manifolds, there is, there's only one contact structure you can have on this S3, because this LA has to be strongly fillable. And there's only one contact structure on S3 which is strongly fillable. So, so this is really a generalization of Mumford's result. Um, I should also say it's kind of a fun exercise to try and prove Nance's result, Mumford's result by 
taking a minimal resolution of a, of a two-dimensional singularity and doing holomorphic curve filling like Gromov did or something like this. That's kind of so, it's like, but it, it, that is like, it is like, um, I don't know, using like a nuclear warhead to weed your garden, but it's still fun to do. Okay, so, um, okay. So now I'm going to talk about minimal discrepancy. Okay. So I'm going to put some constraints on the link. So, so we're going to assume the first churn class of this contact structure is zero, and uh, h1 of the link with q coefficients is zero. Okay. To define minimal discrepancy, actually all you need is c1 to be torsion, um, and then, and then. And you don't need this condition. There's a, there's a lemma in algebraic geometry called the negativity lemma, which will get rid of this condition. But I want to keep these two conditions in. Um, so in, if you have these two conditions, then the minimal discrepancy will actually be an integer. And this is just, use, this is just a useful simplifying thing um, for just for the purposes of this talk. OK. OK. OK, so what I'm going to do, so this section is called minimal discrepancy. So what am I going to do? So first of all, I'm going to take A, and I'm going to resolve A at 0. Some resolution. Of A at 0. So that means away from 0, this is a biholomorphism. But at 0, um, it's, it's not a biholomorphism. And also, the inverse of 0 is going to be a union of smooth, transversely intersecting complex hypersurfaces. So this is E1 to EL. So these are called the exceptional divisors, OK? And then, so, uh, so here's a picture. I take A, which I'm just going to schematically draw like this. And then I'm going to resolve it. So that means I have this map pi. And I have some smooth thing, which I'm going to call A tilde. And, and then I have these EIs sort of here or something. E, EIs. And then what am I going to do? So I'm going to define A epsilon to be the intersection of A with a small ball. So A intersect B epsilon. It's a small closed ball. And then A A epsilon tilde to be the pre-image of this. OK? So this is A epsilon. And I take the pre-image, and I get some other manifold with boundary a tilde epsilon here. Okay? And then if you look here, this is the link of A. And because this is a biholomorphism away from 0, the boundary of this A tilde epsilon is also the link of A. So this is um, 
link of A, which is the same as the boundary of A tilde epsilon. So I'll write that here as well. So So that's all the um, notation I have. And then we have a long exact sequence. So I use this long board for the long exact sequence. So h1 of la with q coefficients, we know that to be 0. This maps to h2 um, of a tilde epsilon uh, relative to its boundary, which is la, again with q coefficients. And we map to h2 of a epsilon. Again, with Q coefficients mapping to um, H2 of LA Q coefficients. And then we have some churn classes. So here we have the churn class of the contact structure, first churn class, which is the same as the first churn class of the tangent bundle to A restricted to LA. And then, and then this is 0 by assumption. And then here, we have the first churn class of the tangent of A, A epsilon tilde. Um, OK. So this maps to 0. So that means there's a, some class here. Just means there exists some class here. It's unique. I'm going to call it T. First, I'm just going to call it C1 A tilde epsilon comma LA. And that maps to here. So this is the relative first chunk class. Okay. Now, as a topological fact, you see, this A epsilon, this is topologically a cone over the, a point. It's a cone over this singular point. So that means A tilde epsilon deformation retracts onto these EIs. So if I look at the Lefschetz dual of this group, I get the homology group H2n minus 2 of A tilde epsilon like this. And this is, this is um, freely generated by classes generated by these exceptional divisors. OK? So from this picture, we see that this relative churn class Relative first churn class Oops. this is equal to some sum A I E I for some unique A I's. So A I is called the discrepancy. So the minimal discrepancy is basically the minimum of these AIs. So minimal discrepancy, to write this down, the minimum of these AIs over all resolutions. And that's pretty hard to compute because you'd have to do every single resolution. But it turns out you only have to do one resolution. So there's another way of writing minimal discrepancy um, as follows. 
So, so the minimal discrepancy equals the minimum of the AIs if this minimum is um, greater than or equal to minus 1 and minus infinity otherwise. So this is for one particular resolution. So that's over all resolutions, and this is just for this one particular resolution. So this is the, the, the recipe we have. Okay, so all you need to do is resolve the singularity, find this relative first Chern class, calculate the minimum of these AIs. Um, usually this is quite difficult to do, but it is, you know, for a lot of singularities you can compute this. But it is pretty hard. Okay. Is that all I have to say about that? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to go back to contact geometry. So I'm just going to look at a con general contact manifold. a general contact manifold with a contact structure, and I'm going to assume the same conditions that I just erased now. So uh, C1 is 0, and H1, just H1 of C, with Q coefficients is 0. So this enables us to define Conley's Ender Index, so we can define So if we have a ray orbit, we can uniquely define a Conley's Ender Index with these conditions here. So what do we do? So I can define the minimal discrepancy of a contact manifold. And this is the, I don't, I'm not sure if this is really the right definition for every contact manifold, but for this purpose, it's probably, this is, for this purpose, it's fine. So what we do is we take some contact structure, any contact structure alpha. So alpha is a contact structure. Um, so alpha is a one form, and the kernel of alpha is our contact structure like this. And then we take, um, should I put this back here? So we're going to, let me phrase this better. So we take the supremum over all contact structures, contact forms, I mean, whose kernel is the contact distribution. And then we take the infimum over all gamma. So gamma is a ray orbit. alpha, and then we define this index. So we take the Connolly's Ender Index of gamma, and then we need to do something to it. So one thing is gamma could be degenerate. So I need to subtract something off, and I'll explain what this is. So we take a half, the dimension of the kernel, d gamma minus the identity. And then we have to add n, n minus 3, so this is an SFT index. That's the minimal discrepancy. So what's this d gamma? So this d gamma is just the linearized return map. So it maps the contact structure to gamma from gamma of 0 to the contact structure of gamma of 1, which is the same as gamma of 0. Um, it's the linearized return map. OK, so that's the minimal discrepancy of contact structure. OK, 
actually maybe uh, I think so yes and Sorry? S3, the standard structure of that, that, uh, that number would be 2. So yes, it would be 2. That's. Oh, uh, wait. 3 minus 3 is 0. Yeah. So it depends how you normalize on the string. Yeah, it's, it's 2. Right? Yes, okay. it's 2. And um, I'm going to prove it. Well, in my theory, I'm going to state that's. It's good you said 2 because um, that's exactly right. Okay, so theorem. So I should release this paper fairly soon. There was this sort of technical thing that um, I might have to overcome, but even even if there even if it didn't overcome that, it's still true. Um, it's just I'd have to change this definition. I didn't want to do that. So, okay. Um, I, I would have to add an extra condition on alpha or something, but it's not like a serious thing. Okay. So. Twice the minimal discrepancy of our isolated singularity A uh, is the minimal discrepancy of our link if the minimal discrepancy of A is greater than or equal to zero. Otherwise, the minimal discrepancy of LA is minus infinity i.e. these infimums always go to minus infinity. So that's the theorem. So, um, okay, so why is this important? Why is this a good thing? So I'm going to explain a couple of reasons why this is a good thing. So the first reason is the main motivation, which is Seidel's, Paul Seidel's conjecture. So I'm going to write another conjecture by... Um, Shakurov. So Shakurov is a birational geometer. So he said, if the minimal discrepancy of A is n minus 1, so n is the complex dimension. So if the complex dimension is 2, then this is 1. 2 times 1 is 2, so you get your 2 here. Um, and a is normal, then A is smooth at zero. So that's the motivating conjecture. And I should just say, he didn't quite state this conjecture like this. He assumed A had another condition which was called Gorenstein. Well, Q Gorenstein. He assumed A was Q Gorenstein. But you can get rid of this condition. So but just by luck, I found this paper on the internet by Buxom, Tommaso de Ferno, Favre, Urbinati. So their work combined with this conjecture gives you this. Shakur's old conjecture gives this conjecture. And then, so, so as a corollary, we get corollary, we get Shakurov conjecture implies Seidel's conjecture because um, because the minimal discrepancy of you know LCN is n minus one which is the same as the minimal discrepancy of a standard sphere. And then on top of that, we have a theorem by, well, it's actually sort of spread over two different papers. So um, this is by Florin Ambro and Markusiewicz. So um, Ambro proved one piece and Markusiewicz I, I think it's the other way around. So Mark Kushevich proved one piece, and then Ambrose sort of filled in the rest or something. 
Um, okay, so Shakurov's is true when the complex dimension of A is 3. So, so from that, we also get if, so then we get the following theorem, if the link of A is contactomorphic to the standard sphere, but now it's the standard 5 sphere, then a is smooth at zero. Okay. And then there's another sort of kind of nice thing which is came for free, which was um, so if the minimal discrepancy of A is positive. Um, uh, this is called then, then this implies A is called a terminal singularity so these are useful in the minimal, minimal model program and um, it's called a canonical singularity so these are you know these, yes Which were otherwise here. So we carry on. It's n minus. Uh, sorry, I'm um, two n minus two. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so this is a good point. So when I, when I said you can do this for one resolution, when it's smooth, you have to blow up once. So if A is smooth, you have to blow up once. Yes, that's a good point. Yes. Um, for, the, for this recipe to work yeah, that I wrote over there before. So you, for, yeah, for when CN is smooth, blow up once. Calculate the discrepancy of this, and you'll get N minus 1. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, that's a good point. So generally, the higher the number, the, be the less singular it is. So, um, so there's another conjecture which says it's no higher than n minus one. So n minus one is the highest number, and that's when it's smooth. And then when it goes down, it's slightly less singular, and that's basically like these terminal singularities. Like, for instance, in the minimal model program, you know, they, they try and run this minimal model program so you try and get a sort of minimal variety, i.e., like, you're trying to blow down your variety so it's as small as possible. And in high dimensions, um, you have to introduce singularities, and they're sort of pretty mild, and they're these terminal ones. Um, so, so I could give you some examples, I suppose. So um, it's actually pretty hard to actually give you explicit formulas. It's actually pretty hard, but I can give you some examples. So... Let's look at weighted homogeneous singularities. So sum zj to the kj equals 0, like this. So kj are integer, non-negative integer, positive integers. So, well, you know, if, if all these k's are 1, then it's smooth. Um, but if... Um, If this is greater than 1, then the minimal discrepancy is positive. So that means these coefficients can't be too big. But, you know, so as the coefficients get bigger, it's sort of more singular. And so, um, so once it goes below minus 1, then it's minus infinity. And you can sort of see that in the sort of um, Rabe dynamics as well. If you, if you look at, you know, this has a nice Rabe flow, the, the link of this thing. Um, if, you, if, you just if you change this contact form very slightly, you can look at the Rabe flow. It's this nice... 
uh, it's just basically something like um, e to the i um, k1 t e to the i k2 t and so on, something like that. Some nice like thing, and you can calculate all the indices, and you'll see that all the indices go up to infinity, and they're all all non-negative when this is one, and then and you just the calculation shows they all go to minus infinity when it's less than one. So Otto von Kurt did these kinds of calculations. So this was another reason for doing this thing. So Otto actually proved, well, sort of morally he proved this um, conjecture when for weighted homogeneous singularities. It's pretty. I, I um, yeah. So there's another conjecture I, that I should say, which is, I mean, what what I think this is is something like the smallest class in which full contact homology is non-zero if you exclude one. Um, um, so then, so some fuller homology theories behind it. Although I don't use full. Con full yeah. Th this. This 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 this, nu this number here, yeah. the sort of minimum of these two numbers. Um, um, so that's what I think should be true. And the proof, the proof uses Grom of Witten invariance, genus zero Grom of Witten invariance. But secretly, it you can see the sort of con full contact homology coming out of it. The proof. So, um, so I have about ten minutes to explain a, a proof. So. Oh, okay. Oh, great. Okay. Good. So, um, okay, so the proof is going to be a bit, it's not going to be quite as precisely stated as all of this, so, because I can't explain everything so nicely. But, um, this thing up here. So what I want to do is, first of all, I will resolve A. So remember I had this resolution near zero for small epsilon. And this is a manifold with boundary. And this actually has some nice symplectic form. If you resolve by blow-ups, this is a nice symplectic form. So we have some nice symplectic form, say omega or something. And um, maybe just for illustrative purposes, uh, what shall I do? Uh, I should... So there's, okay, so what, I, what, I, what I'm going to do is I'll prove it for when you blow up, there's only one divisor. And then there's a sort of trick which makes everything much easier. So I'll, I'll just explain that, and then I'll do two divisors. And then, there's, then, then, it, then it's a, bit, a lot harder, but it's still doable. So we'll do one divisor first. So uh, E1 equals the unique exceptional divisor. Assume this. So we have this symplectic manifold. A. So this is this is a tilde epsilon. This whole thing. And then this is L a. So L a is um, the orange bit. And then let's say e e one is this blue bit here. Okay. And for epsilon small enough, what you can show 
is you have this nice sort of symplectic disk bundle like this around E, like this. If you choose epsilon small enough, you can do this. If you choose your omega well and so on. And so what you can do, and this is you can only do this with one divisor, and this is why it's a bit, so you can compactify this. So, that, so, we, so we have this nice projection map, so um, say um, PR or something, mapping, um, let's say the interior of A tilde epsilon to, to E1. Okay, so this is this vibration. And then we can compactify this to a P1 vibration, so compactify. So we get some nice P1 vibration, PR bar, from some A epsilon bar to E1. So we've compactified it. So there's A epsilon is some larger space. OK. And then what I do, I don't really need to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway for make my life easier. I blow up. A tilde, tilde epsilon bar at this point here outside A tilde. So I blow up, blow up here. So I have some exceptional divisor here like this. Um, so then this is now the blow up of A tilde epsilon bar like this. And then I look at, so I blew up along a point. And so there's a unique fiber going through this point. And I take the proper transform of that unique fiber. So this is the proper transform of this fiber through here. And this, is, um, this represents a homology class, A. a, a OK? Oh, I don't, shouldn't use A. I use that in my paper as well. That's bad. I should use some other letter, alpha. OK? So what I do is I notice that the Grom of Witten invariant with class genus zero Grom of Witten invariant with class alpha, this is just one with no constraints. Okay. So what do I want to do? So uh, actually maybe I should have said something before this. So, so the first thing I can do, so what I want to do is Remember, when I defined minimal discrepancy, it was this sort of infant sup. So I want, to, I want to find a lower bound and an upper bound for this minimal discrepancy. So to find the, the, the um, let's see which way around it is. To find the upper bound, all I need to do is find an explicit contact form so that, you know, the lowest index ray orbit is exactly the minimal discrepancy. So I claim that's the natural rotation. You know, this is a natural vibration, and I just take the natural rotation that, that gives, if you calculate what the Conley's Ender Index is for that, that's exactly the minimal discrepancy. Um, so remember, you also have to subtract half the dimension of the kernel of the linearized return map in this case, because it's a unique, it's a flow that's periodic. Uh, you have to subtract sort of half 2n minus 1 or something like that. So you can do this. So, you know, actually a good example to think of is the, the smooth singularity where you the when, when A is smooth, you blow up once. Your e, E1 is the exceptional divisor. And then this flow is just the hop flow. Hop flow. And you calculate the index. And then subtract this half thing. It's like a Morse spot perturbation. And you're taking the lowest index of this Morse spot perturbation. Okay. So now what you want to do is to show, you want to show for every other contact form, um, there exists a ray orbit whose index is sufficiently low, i.e., the minimal discrepancy or lower. So let's suppose I have another contact form. Now what do I do? I take these disks and I stretch them so they're much bigger. I give them much more area. And then if it's big enough, then I can embed. So supposing I have another, con so supposing I have some contact form sort of alpha. So the kernel of alpha is our contact structure. And I have this other contact form. 
Um, so I have this contact manifold. So I'll write this in um, pink. I did pink already. Red C alpha. Okay? And I embed this C alpha as a contact submanifold in here. So after making these fibers big enough, I can do that. So this is a C alpha, like this. And then I next stretch, next stretch along C alpha. So what do I get? Well, you know, you'd have these sort of holomorphic kind of build buildings that um, Yanko was drawing. So uh, maybe I should just draw all the colors. So I have this A tilde epsilon, the sort of edge of this A tilde epsilon. And then I have this uh, orange bit, which was uh, here, I suppose. And then. Uh, and then I'm stretching along this red piece. So I have this red piece, and there's this sort of, I'm stretching along here, and it breaks along this red piece. This is C alpha. And then I have the interior inside here. So I have this E in, this, this E1 inside here, like this. So this is my um, building that I've stretched along here, and it's split. And then I have some holomorphic curve. So it's like this. And it might have some pieces like this. And it's going through this exceptional divisor like this with intersection with multiplicity 1. And then I have something down here as well. So because this has intersection multiplicity, so I can show this piece here is irreducible. If there's any other component, there's some sort of maximum principle will stop it from happening. And also, um, it has intersection multiplicity 1, so it's somewhere injective. So I can use a result by Dragnev to show this is actually regular for a generic complex structure, almost complex structure. And so I can do an index calculation. I can calculate the sum of the indices of these orbits. And, uh, and, and you'll find out, you'll get, exact, you'll get this exact inequality once you do this. So you'll find some orbit of sufficiently low index here by this Dragnev result. So that's the, how you do the proof with one exceptional divisor. But how do you do it with many? Because the problem with many exceptional divisors is you just cannot compactify. There's no way of compactifying this in a nice way so that you, know, you get this nice Grom of Witten invariant like this. So what do you do? Um, I should also say, um, what am I doing in the full contact homology world? So this blow up, this represents me choosing a minimum rave orbit. And then this count of curves is me counting disks. Um, and, and I'm sort of showing that as a non-trivial element of contact homology by showing this disk count is non-zero. OK. So how do I do it for, maybe I should write this over here. Sorry. OK. So how do I do it for a general singularity? So let's suppose now we have two divisors. So once we know, but know what to do with two, then we know what to do with all of them, basically. So I'm just going to do two. So we have two divisors, E1, E2. So now, I wrote them in blue, didn't I? E1. E2. And they have minimal discrepancies. They have discrepancies. A1 and A2. So what can I do? So there's this E1 and E2, and it's inside this, um, this big this A tilde epsilon. So the first thing I can do is just make them symplectically orthogonal. I can perturb them so they're symplectically orthogonal. And then I can choose some nice um, contact neighborhood. So I can choose a very nice contact neighborhood. So I won't explain too much about this. But basically, if I, 
you know, if I take this manifold with corners, I took this tubular neighborhood and I intersect it with this tubular neighborhood here, and then I smooth out this corner, I have a very nice contact manifold. And I can control this smoothing so that I get all ray bits of the nice index and so on. So what do we get? We get a nice, as before, we had this nice vibration. We get a nice sort of vibration here, but it gets all messed up over here. We have a nice vibration here. So we have these nice circular ray flows here and here away from this smoothing. So, um, so we have some nice ray bit here, and we have some nice ray bit here. Okay. And this neighborhood is very, very close to this E1 and E2. And I can, I can show its contact amorphic to this LA. And I can calculate its minimal discrepancy as before, um, just for this specific contact form and I get exactly what I want. And this is where you use these discrepancies, because these are sort of churn numbers, and so you can calculate the Conley's Endronics using these churn numbers. And so how do you do this Grom of Witten invariant? Well, let's assume A1 is less than or equal to A2. And if A1 is equal to A2, then we just choose the shortest ray orbits. And you can calculate the length of these ray orbits, actually, because you, 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 you resolve the singularity by blowing up the size of these blow-ups dictate the length of these ray orbits, so you choose the shortest one. I mean, again, if you think about when A is smooth, the size, you know, the size of the ray orbits is detected, de detected by the size of your symplectic blow-up. So it's the same principle works in general. And then, so we assume A1, if A1 is A2, we assume this ray orbit is smaller than this one. And then what do we do? What do we do? We take some point here, away from here, and we look at this vibration just in the very small ball neighborhood of this point. This ball has to be big enough so that its uh, radius is bigger than the radius of this thing here, but that's okay. And then I compactify this to a P1 just in this neighborhood here. And then I blow up, as before, just here, like this. And then I'm counting, I have this proper transform of this thing here, and this is my class alpha. And I want to do a Grom of Witten count of this. Now, where do I get problems? Well, first of all, this is a non-compact thing. So if you have a non-compact thing, you have a holomorphic curve, and it'll go off to infinity. And so how do you prevent that from happening? So well, in this case, with this specific contact structure and some choice of contact form, everything stays in here. Everything has very small energy. It just stays in here. But what I want to do is next stretch so I can embed this C alpha inside here. So I need to, I need to sort of embed this C alpha inside here like this. And so I want a next stretch. So I want something big. So I really, really do need compactness. And this is where this minimal discrepancy thing comes in. This, condition, this minimal discrepancy is necessary. So what do I do? You know, what I did here was I stretched these fibers so that they were big enough so that I could embed this C alpha. So I do the same here. I sort of stretch, you know, I add a cylindrical end to this thing. And I stretch these fibers here as well. And and um, so, so how do I prevent, um, um, how do I make things compact? So what do I do? I do a next, I, I, I need to just choose some almost complex structure, which is, which, um, so that compactness holds. And so what I do is I um, choose some nice, you know, cylindrical complex structure here, which is, you know, which makes, say, this vibration holomorphic here. Um, maybe it has to be stable Hamiltonian in this region, but it doesn't matter. It's basically something nice and cynical here. And then I look at this piece. So this piece is this, like this top piece here. So it's just this top piece, this top piece here. But now it isn't compactified everywhere. You just have this tiny bit of compactification here. And then the rest is sort of non-compact over here and here. And you want to prevent, you know, some holomorphic curves sort of going out here and, and um, you, know, break, you know, losing compactness. So how do you prevent that? Well, you stretch along this orange boundary here. And then you get, if you stretch along this orange boundary, so you stretch along this orange boundary, next stretch, so you stretch along it like this. And then if you had some sequence of holomorphic curves sort of going to infinity, or which is, let's, say, let's say it's inside some very large compact set, um, then I'll get some holomorphic curves sort of, as I stretch, I'll get some holomorphic curve breaking like this. 
And then you do an index calculation and you show that such curves can't exist. It's very similar to the index calculation that I did before. So there is some inequality that goes in. Sorry? There's some inequality that goes in that this kind of thing. Yes, yes, that's why. Yeah. The point is that, you know, these ray bits sort of near here have very low index. And 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 and, and this green exceptional divisor sort of ensure sort of makes sure that that the, that the ray ball bits here have very low index. And so if this went too far out here, it would break at an orbit which had too high index. Um, so it has to be sort of all constrained in this, this piece here. Um, yeah. So that's my, yeah, that's, I think I'll stop there. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah.